discuss the request for expressions of interest put out on the site. Um, we're here to kind of go over a couple things. We'll, we'll talk a little bit briefly about eligibility requirements. Let's see if I can get my slides to move. There we go. Uh, then we'll go over view, we'll do an overview of the site from our development services team. This will be kind of a PDC style, a pre development conference style, if you're familiar with how we do things at the city of Fort Worth. So a couple of our development service staff will kind of give us an overview from their different perspectives on the site. Um, after that, uh, we did have one pre-submitted question, so we'll go over that and then we'll open it up to you all um, to do uh, some open, open Q&A. All right. Martha, so just, before we get started, do you want to uh, remind everyone that we're going to be recording this meeting and putting it on the Evans and Rosedale webpage? I'd love to. Um, <laughs> so yes, this meeting will be recorded. We'll upload um, this recording with um, any kind of questions that we talk about today. So you can come back and you can revisit um, if you, you know, maybe you like to take notes, but maybe you want to just soak it in and listen, you can come back. Um, for those who are unable to attend um, from your teams, you can forward that along. Um, that'll be posted on the on the web page that we have everything else on. So that's fortworthtexas.gov slash evro, E-V-R-O. Um, all right, so jumping into eligibility and selection criteria. Um, so hopefully you all had a chance to review the RFEI, the request for expressions of interest before you um, arrived here today. But in case you did not, we just wanted to quickly brush on, you know, what we're looking for and kind of how these um, things will be scored. Um, before we even get to our scoring matrix, there's a couple things that the developers must meet. Um, first and foremost, uh, experience that have someone ha you must have financed, built, and received a certificate of occupancy on a mixed use development with a total project value of at least 50 million. So that has to be something um, that has been accomplished within your team. The second, um, you must have com completed at least one project that has met or exceeded a local community participation or business equity firm. Some might know it as MWBE goal or component. Um, past that, then we'll be looking at the actual development proposal. This proposal must be a mixed use um, development that composes of both commercial and retail for small businesses and residential. If the if the development teams and the proposals meet those criteria, uh, then we'll be going on to an evaluation by our selection committee. Our selection committee is comprised of five um, senior staff members here from across departments um, at the city of Fort Worth. Uh, the entity, the Near Southside Inc., who uh, runs the TIF over this area, and then two of our community members um, from the Historic Southside Neighborhood Association. Uh, the things that they'll be looking at, um, really qualifications of the master developer, um, demonstrating that ability to execute. We really want to see that you've done this kind of a project, you've executed, you've been able to finance a project like this. That's going to be key for we want to make sure that what's being proposed, we know it's going to get off the ground. Um, Second, uh, developers should have those strengths in urban design. Um, there's a lot of different resources to look at um, when it comes to urban design, but really checking out our master, our urban village master plan for that area. Um, we want walkable, we want it to be pedestrian oriented. You heard that from some of our community members today. Um, they really wanna be a, it to be a place um, of really a community hub. You see, I mentioned, I know a couple of people were walking alongside me. We talked about how, you know, they use, that park space, they, they close down the streets sometimes to have um, festivals and things like that. So really activating the streets, uh, making it kind of a premier place that people want to come and live um, and hang out. Uh, third, demonstrating that strong uh, record of community engagement. Um, this is a very important neighborhood for the city. Uh, this is a very important community. They're very engaged and community engagement is gonna be a big, a big um, component of this, continuing to communicate with the neighborhood association. Um, so we really wanna make sure that you've, you you've see that um, your team has done that before and done it successfully. Um, and has kind of looked at what we've put in that proposal. We've, we've gathered a lot of community feedback through surveys. Um, over the years, we've done so many plans of this neighborhood. They're really ready to see some of those things executed as we are as well. Um, so seeing that you kind of listen to the community and have tailored your proposal, um, specifically meeting some of those needs. So developers should honor the history and vision of the neighborhood. Um, I know Robert kind of talked about some of the cultural symbols that we saw um, around that park, but looking at the buildings in the area, um, being responsive to the design, uh, you know, maybe that's 
being inspired by the brick, whatever that means to you or as your team is going through that process of thinking through your proposal. Um, and then the last thing will just be in alignment, you know, with the plans that we have for the area, for the city, the goals, um, looking at the form based code, looking at some of our design standards um, and really trying to stick with that. We're really we love the design standards that have been developed for this area. You see a lot of them on the other side of the highway um, in the near south side, and it's been very successful. And so um, this neighborhood's worked hard um, to kind of help inform the city and how they want those to be seen. So we want to see that alignment there. And I won't go through all this, but make sure you kind of study. This is our selection criteria uh, matrix. And you can see kind of how we break that down point wise as well. Um, this is on page 18 of the RFEI. All right, so at this point, I'm going to kick it over to our development services department, um, Tony, and they're going to kind of give you an overview pre development conference style of the site. Tony, I think you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Uh, and yes, we're going to we're going to walk through this like a traditional pre development conference and provide uh, some information based on what we know about the site and, and based on what we may have learned over the, over the last couple of years working on the previous project. Uh, I'm Tony Rotigliano. I am in project facilitation and we'll just go through the, a roundtable discussion working through all our review teams to kind of give you an overview of, of what we know as it relates to this site. Martha, I'm going to share my screen just to, just so we have a map reference for our review teams as well. Uh, and that way Thanks. we can we can look at that. OK, hopefully everybody can see the screen now. Mm -hmm. All right, let's kick off with zoning and we have Estefania Barreto. Hey, Estefania. Hi, thank you, Tony. Um, this property is zoned NST4R, which means that it needs a certificate of appropriateness um, before it can get approved to go through permitting. So before the permitting, permitting process even starts, it needs a certificate of, of appropriateness or a COA. If you need waivers from the near south side guidelines, which is how we look at the COA, um, you have to go to the Urban Design Commission or the UDC. If you do not need any waivers from the Urban Design Commission, um, from your design standards, then um, the project can be administratively approved. Um, some of the major items from the Near Southside Guidelines are going to be um, for an NST4R property, there's a 20 foot maximum setback. There's an 18 foot um, minimum facade height. Um, there are three stories um, maximum if you do not have a site bonus or if you do not have a height bonus. Um, with one height bonus, you can build up to five stories. And with two height bonuses, you can build up to six stories. Um, the bonuses are a mix of residential and non-residential. So you would already have at least one height bonus with making sure that this project's mixed use. Um, other ways to get a height bonus are providing public space that's greater than 2,500 square feet um, and then providing structured parking if you're providing 75% of the off street spaces. Um, parking needs to be located behind the building or next to the building. And since this property is less than 250 feet away from A5 zoning, um, there is an off street parking requirement. Usually there's not, but because you're within the 20, 250 feet, there is. However, um, you're only required to meet 75% of the off street requirements um, based off whatever's in the city ordinance um, based on the uses for your building. Um, those are the main items. Other things such as like materials and, and other smaller items for signage, you can find those in the near south side guidelines. All right, thank you, Estefania. Let's turn our attention to platting. We have Alex Parks. Alex. So the previous development that came in has done a lot of the legwork that would be necessary for redevelopment of this property. The large block there that's bound by Missouri on the uh, east, uh, South Freeway on the west, and Terrell Avenue to the north and Dashwood Avenue to the south, 
previously had an alley running north south in the block. That alley vacation has gone through the process and an ordinance number has been issued for it. So the replatting of that block would be very simple. Um, would not requ would not require too much work. Um, a, a replat application just simply needs to be submitted. The previous application I would assume is not going to be picked up by the new developer. They would have to submit their own replat application because these were submitted by a different developer. Um, the replat itself is approved administratively. There are no uh, public hearings associated with it. One of the other vacations that was associated with this was a vacation of a sliver of uh, the right of way along Dashwood. They they were narrowing the right of way in uh, I'll call it an uneven pattern for the specific knee uh, for the specific want to bury the overhead electric lines in that location. Um, since that vacation has also been approved, that option potentially could be on the table for the development. Um, if the. If, if they're configuring the site in a similar fashion. Uh, the other the other block on the other side also had some north south alleys running through the block that have also been vacated and ordinances issued for those. So the replanting of that block uh, on the east side of Missouri would also be fairly simple. So the plotting process is going to be the easier part. Um, the thing that the thing that ultimately ended up um, stopping the original development from crossing the finish line is originally they had their access to their buildings turned to the internal local streets, which those simply would have required parkway permits from transportation and instead turn their access to the block along the uh, west side of Missouri adjacent to South Freeway and turn their access out towards the freeway and the frontage road. And by doing so, they were they were required to get textile permits. If they didn't have to get textile permits, the platting process would be fairly simple and this could be this could be easily developed. Uh, but the Ability to gain access to tax dot is what ultimately led to this project not move. Well, they did. They never finalized the plat, let's say, because they never they never officially got those tax dot permits for that development. That's all I've got for now, unless anybody has any specific questions. All right, Alex, thank you. Well, I think we'll get to the questions at the end. Uh, let's talk now with Transportation Development Services and Tom Simmerly. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, Alex covered some of the transportation elements, but uh, a traffic impact study was uh, uh, completed, I believe, July of 2022. So uh, it's been long enough that we would we will require a new traffic impact study. Uh, the existing study uh, could be made available to uh, whoever requests it. Uh, you know, through through our uh, Public information request uh, portal. Uh, uh, there may be some changes to the methodology, and that's why we want to do that. As Alex said, the uh, you know the parking garage that was going to serve the multifamily mixed-use development on that block uh, had its uh, entry and exit off of the frontage road, and that in in and of itself was an issue from just a general traffic standpoint, but, uh, you know, understanding that, uh, you know, the development itself would want to be internal to, to, you know, along Missouri Street, but, you know, just just having that access off the fringe road was was uh, a, a source of angst by us traffic engineers as well as TxDOT evidently, so that's something to consider. Uh, really, uh, in Listening to some of the uh, to the community meetings out there, you know some of the uh, issues. Were, you know, one of which was safety, uh, street lighting. I know there's some street lights out there. I think uh, pedestrian lighting will obviously be a, a part of what's required uh, based on uh, not just our requirements, but on the near south side 
uh, requirements also, I think. So uh, li uh, lining this uh, for safety as well as uh, walkability is, is a kind of a key element from uh, the pedestrian side of the transportation element. Uh, uh, you know, sidewalks are, you know, some of those have already been constructed, but uh, wide sidewalks, uh, safety lighting as well as ped lighting and uh, providing uh, alternative access to the parking garage is going to be required uh, for the mixed use development. And really, that's all I have. OK, Tom, Tony, can I jump in real Please. quick? Yeah, so uh, just a note for the teams. Um, one of the areas we've heard on transportation uh, and impacts for the area was and you've heard about the Juneteenth Museum that is also being slated to be established in that area. Uh, and so part of the comments we were hearing from the community was, are we, is the development team looking at not just their piece and what those transportation impacts are gonna be, but how does that play into what's being planned with the Juneteenth Museum? And are, are, is the development team looking at that holistically as opposed to just kind of we're dealing with our piece, the GNT is dealing with their piece, and somehow that all gets figured out in the wash. So I just want to put that out there. It's just something to be aware of. It's just thinking through how the development may lay out uh, that you, you're probably going to have to kind of think a little bit broader scale about what some of those other potential impacts could be. And and I also know, because they mentioned on that as well, um, keeping those buried power lines. I know that was a piece that we worked through with off for and it did get approved. So if it's possible to work through that and keep those, I think that's something the community really wanted to see. And it also just brings up that quality of development in the area. Um, and I know it was also mentioned, but you know, street trees and really having a lot of shade on the street was really big for the community too. And so those were a couple of the sticking points that really helped, you know, we had to have some conversation back and forth. Um, they mentioned safety and pedestrian lighting. A lot of that's kind of included in the, the development design guideline codes, but those were all things that continued to come up. So thanks, Tony. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all very much. Uh, and one thing in, in relation to the TxDOT uh, approval, it sounded like it was conditionally approved uh, in late 2023. So they did get some positive feedback from TxDOT on their access previously. All right, let's now switch gears. We've got Stormwater and Mr. Leon Wilson. Hey, good afternoon. Tony, let me share my screen. Yes, sir. Please do. <clears throat> okay, this the site will require a final drainage study. There was one previously done for the uh, previous development, and a subsequent grading um, permit would be required uh, prior to building permit. The primary issue with this site is, or the hurdle that the other development had was the site drains to the south and the area I have that's shown in orange is city flood risk area. So that is, you know, documented flooding that we've established by uh, detail to these studies. So we so we know that it floods. And I think their solution was an underground detention in this area. So just be aware of the challenges uh, that you're going to have <clears throat> with the, the storm drain uh, storm drainage runoff because the system is undersized. There is a system in the area, but it doesn't have the capacity for the uh, development. And in, for anyone that proceeds, we're going to advise everyone to schedule a separate stormwater PDC, which we will go in more detail about the stormwater requirements for the site. And that can be scheduled at SDS at FortworthTexas.gov. And Tony, that's primarily what I have. Oh, I appreciate that, Leon. Hey, Tony, uh, this is yes, Amy. Do you mind if I say something? Please um, go right ahead. Just a, yeah, a quick word about stormwater. Um, the previous plans had planned to create underwater stormwater detention facilities underneath the proposed park area. And that was an agreement that was come to with the Housing Finance Corporation. Um, not an ideal situation, but if that becomes this the the solution that needs to be done just know that that is something that the hfc would be willing to do yeah all right thank you amy 
OK. Now let's talk with Subi Verahis with water. Hey, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, Hi, can I sc share my screen? Yes, please do. Subi. OK, one second. Looks like it's still thinking about it, Subi. You still there, Subi? Technology starts again. Yep. Yep. Subi, you want me to uh, share my screen? It shows that he's presenting, so he may not be able to hear us. He may be frozen on his side. Yeah. Oh, man. The map that I had uh, denoted the, the water lines. Hello? Can hey, you see yeah. my screen? Hey. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. Somehow. I don't know what happened. Can you see my screen? No. No, we can't. Um, OK, one second, one second. I can share my screen as well, CB. Can you see my screen? Yep. Oh, yes. OK, thank you. <laughs> Something happened to my computer. OK. So this area, it, it's uh, water and sea where it's, uh, it's straightforward. And uh, there's an existing 8-inch sewer line and a 12-inch water line on the Missouri Avenue. Uh, and there is a stub out, 8-inch PVC stub out to this lot. And they can tie into that water line. And there is a 10-inch water line on uh, Evans Avenue. And uh, 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 you know, you need to check with the uh, WPD for study required or not, because you know the the meter size depends on the study. So th that's a one thing you need to know. And one more thing, uh, there is an 18-inch PVC uh, sewer line stub out in this lot, and you can tie into that sewer line too. And there is an existing CAP project on. Uh, Dashwood Avenue, Dashwood Street. It's currently under design, um, and I don't have any updates on this project. And it's currently under design. So that's all I think. Uh, Jeremy, you, do you want to add something? Yeah, no. I'm trying to find the notes from uh, the previous PDC to see if there was anything. Uh, talked about at that time. Um, it's from 2022, so give me just a second. Subi, uh, just a clarifying question. Uh, WPD, what does that stand for, and what exactly do they want? Uh, do they want to study, or do they just want a loading demand? I think they need a lo loading demand, I think, based on the previous study, so I need to double check with them. And WPD is Water Planning Department? Yes, yes, Water what, what Planning Department, yes, Matt's group. Matt Kuzner, yep. Yeah, Matt Kuzner. Okay, um, this is Jeremy. I'm under Subi and Ty. Um, I pulled up the notes from uh, June 9th of 2022. Um, a water demand and sewer loading will be required. Uh, private pressure regulating valves will be required. Um, Let's see here. Uh, there's no pro rata fees uh, at that time. Um, I would need to look at it and see if we have any new ones real quick. Give me just a second. Um, yes. So there is going to be Let's see here. Can I share my screen just so we can? Sure. 
Okay, yep. give me just a second to turn a couple things back off. Okay, share. Okay, can we see my GIS? Mm, yes, sir. Okay, so we do have uh, a couple of front foot charges uh, for the Missouri. Um, looks like it's going to be water and sewer. Oh, and it's not loading. So um, the front foot charges I can give you uh, or I can send to Tony yep. the uh, applicable codes so you can figure out how you need to or how, how much it's going to uh, to cost for the connections. It's all based off the size and um, you know relative to how far and everything. Um, let me see here. Let's see here. I'm sorry, I'm I'm scrolling That's through our okay. notes. Um, and then my my typical notes that I usually say uh, when I'm doing these, uh, if any part of your project requires you to go to IPRC, then all of your water and sewer infrastructures is also going to need to go to IPRC. Um, all of your or any of your water and sewer impact fees are going to uh, be applied to your building permits. And that's generally about all the the general stuff that I've got. That's perfect, Jeremy. Thank yeah, you. I would like to add one more thing on the Missouri Street. Uh, the existing water line, it's too close to the property line, so maybe they need to provide additional 10 foot easement for that existing water line. Missouri Street, okay. Miss, not Missouri Avenue. Yes, Missouri yeah. Avenue. OK, Subi, Jeremy, thank you both. We also have today uh, Lori Gordon with Parks. Hi, Lori. I need to find my microphone thing. Um, hi, and Amy and uh, Martha, you all may want to chime in on this as well. There is a park component to this development, and uh, uh, the consultant, we, we had had a consultant on board previously to help with the park design, and we can revisit that. Uh, and it might be a, a better offline conversation. Yeah, the park is really intended to be a uh, uh, sort of a retail and neighborhood oriented plaza. So it should really be viewed as something that would really serve the development, but also provide the neighborhood with space for um, various outdoor activities and events. Um, in the general location, that was around it's kind of the, the rear of the public plaza we were in this afternoon. Yeah, so that's just the really space street with that. the same Missouri Street. The location of that. Okay, thank you all, Lori. Thank you very much. Let's circle back to our friends with fire and uh, Donna York. Hi, Lieutenant York. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I, I just kind of jumped in here and was thinking that we were going to have other staff on. So if I don't answer all of your questions, I'll be happy to set up a meeting afterwards. Um, just I'm looking at the site plan that's related to an existing uh, final plat. So I uh, apologize if you've already covered that. I want to make sure it's the same case um, for the for FS 23089. Is that still the correct uh, case for this project? No, no, prob probably not. They probably will have to submit a, a new site plan. So just general, if you could just give us some general guidance on issues okay. and opportunities in this area okay um I, I just you know without a site plan there's really not a whole lot i can pass on if if you can narrow it down to maybe just a multifamily or uh commercial type project i can kind of give you some guidelines on that and again it, it might be best if we have to set up a separate meeting sure sure i think generally speaking this would be a mixed use type project okay so. um so I, from that perspective, uh, most mixed use, if it's um, got um, a multifamily component to it, you're going to see the need for either the building to be surrounded by public streets or your fire lanes to provide access need to be a minimum of 26 feet wide. 
and the purpose of those uh, fire lanes, or you can measure from the, the existing public streets, is to provide um, the hose light to the building within 150 feet if it doesn't have sprinklers or 300 feet if it does have sprinkler systems. Um, m most of the mixed use that we see are large enough that they do require uh, fire sprinkler systems. Um, and that would also include your parking garages um, and uh, the uh, residential areas in, in addition to any commercial buildings uh, that are within or occupancies that are within. Um, it depends on how how many how much area this takes up. If it's one building or multiple buildings, occasionally we'll we'll have to name some of the emergency access easements for addressing. But if it's uh, one large building, typically we can address it just off of uh, one of the public streets that's adjacent to it. So you may not need to worry about that. Um, hydrants, uh, the hose lay for multifamily. Uh, and any commercial use is 600 feet, and that's going to be measured along a drivable path, and and then along the fire lane around the exterior walls of the building. Um, if you do have a taller building than uh, 55 feet at the uh, floor level of the highest occupied floor, uh, some addition additional fire lane setbacks um, would be required, and I can provide additional information if that's if that's the case. Um, that's really. The, the basics and uh, we, we'll follow up with some more information and then we can coordinate um, offline if there are other um, areas that we haven't covered. No, oh, that's great. Lieutenant York, thank you very much. <laughs> Martha and team, that, that concludes kind of the roundtable discussion. We've got a few other folks on the call that have some history with this particular site. I do want to note that we have Evan Roberts and Cody Hughes here with our building department and they can answer any building specific questions. Um, so feel free to take it over and start the Q&A. Thanks, Tony. Um, let's see. All right, um, before we jump into our pre-submitted questions, y'all made me nervous, so I forgot to introduce our amazing panel up here, of people who you need to know. So um, I'll, I guess I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, so. Mm -hmm. Again, Robert Stern, Economic Development Director. I'm Amy Connolly. I'm a Neighborhood Services Assistant Director, but also Administrator at the HFC. <clears throat> Christina Woods, Chief Faculty Officer and Director of Diversity and Inclusion. So anything business equity, uh, that is in our department. So yeah, as you can see, this has really been an all hands on deck effort um, on behalf of the city. Everybody's very involved, very excited about this project. So. With that, we'll hop into our pre-submitted questions and then we'll open it up for um, Q&A. So our first and only question we got, because nobody wanted to give us anything ahead of time, um, <laughs> will the current design team still stay on board or will you be seeking a new team? Would you like to answer that? Yeah, so um, right now this process is very wide so. While the prior group did do a lot of work it relates to the design, uh, the guys here, Josh, uh, you know, Josh in the back, uh, they did a lot of work with the previous group. Um, so we're not committed to those plans, but obviously I, I think given the amount of input that, um, that the prior group had received from the community, I, I think Looking at those would probably help guide some of your thinking as you put together your own your own plans. But but as now you're not required to utilize those plans. Yeah, so uh, definitely uh, the prior plans got to permitting, so they went through IPRC. They've been through all the city work, so it it does. I'm just going to repeat, it does move you to look at those plans. Yeah, it might save you a lot of time. Um, so that's what we would recommend. Um, but we, we, can't, we can't specify what engineer or to use. But um, uh, the prior developer had gone through to all permitting, be ready to go. All right. So as we open it up for Q and A, um, for those who are in the room, I just ask that you speak loud so that our folks online can hear your question. 
Um, and then those who are attending virtually, please go ahead and type your questions in the chat. Um, we have someone in the room who will um, put you in order and we will kind of bounce between um, those questions as they're received. So does anyone have any questions? All right. Yes. If we submitted a uh, pre-development hearing request to the city, do you think we should rescind that and try to work directly with the folks at development services that were already working on the site that were on this call so that we don't have like a pre-development hearing with a bunch with lots of other city staff folks that, that may not be as well versed as um, you know Tony and Tom and some of the others that, that are on the call this this afternoon? Um I'll I'll let Tony weigh in with the essay comments, but I, I would generally think that would probably be a good idea. But but Tony, what are your, yeah, what are your thoughts? I agree, Daniel. I certainly want to want to get get something set up uh, with the folks that have been on this site for for a long time. So we would necessarily need to do a traditional PDC request. We could come back with a with a one off meeting that would be better served for everybody. And, and so um, it's my understanding that there could potentially be some public dollars utilized here that may potentially have been appropriated from the federal level. Do we have any general idea on um, kind of some of the, the requirements or kind of best efforts that we want to see in terms of Davis bacon wages, certified payroll, um, minority participation on the actual you know consulting or, or construction side, or, or is that something that that whoever ends up winning will find out later? I wonder. Um, it's a lot, a lot wrapped up in that question. Let me try to <laughs> we start with the incentive side, then I'll work around to the to the. Uh, contract compliance piece. Uh, so the project, you're correct. The project did have a number of um, public resources tied to the, the prior project. Uh, so there was uh, some ARPA dollars that were uh, committed to the overall project. Uh, the TIF had committed about $7 million um, to public infrastructure improvements related to the project. Uh, and then we had a chapter 380 agreement uh, basically, that's a grant of incremental property tax and sales tax generated by the project back to the developer. So that was kind of the general structure of the incentive package. Um, I, I'll say we're, we're kind of open to how that how that's going to be. You know what we would structure with the new development team. I will say that we did not want the timelines of this project to be driven by the ARPA dollars. So as you know, ARPA has a uh, timing deadlines that they have to be committed by the end of this year and they have to be expended by the end of 2026. Um, so uh, what we have heard is that uh, if we have a development that comes forward uh, that makes sense, but it's not going to fall within that guideline of being able to commit those ARPA dollars, that we will just supplement those funds with general fund dollars. So again, I think that that pot of funds would still potentially be there. I will note that the ARPA funds were really set aside to reimburse both the Housing Finance Corporation and the Local Development Corporation for the land. So those, those are the two main entities that own the property. And the general structure was that uh, we would put the land in basically for a dollar and that those two entities would get reimbursed from those ARPA funds. So those, those dollars weren't really going to the developer itself, but it was an offset to the cost of the overall project. Um, on the business equity requirement, so in our policy, our economic development incentive policy, we do have a minimum 15% on the hard construction costs uh, for any, any project that we incentivize, obviously. Uh, but I will say that, you know, we are looking for a robust MWB commitment or business equity commitment on this project. So I, I'm not going to sit here and toss out a percentage. Uh, I will just say that north of 15 would be really, really good. Um, and, and that's not only that's that's not only on the construction side, but I will say uh, as, as we've talked to the, the residents in the neighborhood, there's some real interest about being engaged in if there's commercial development activities. So let's say there's small retail opportunities, you know, that that neighborhood wants to be have an opportunity to have those shops being to work those shops. So again, it, it the the business equity piece goes beyond 
just the construction side, but it's how do we engage more fully uh, during the construction and then both after the construction as well. And Stan, I don't know if you have any comments, thoughts. <laughs> yeah, just to, to circle back, the mayor for council members expressed earlier in the day that we on site. This project is um, a long time coming for the community, and um, it is not only the neighborhood and the city's expectation that our local residents will be fully engaged and involved at every level of the process um, speaks to not only engaging them in, in some decision making processes, but more importantly, in the economic piece, right? So that means um, our, our department is, is ready uh, to help you identify local contractors who are willing and able uh, to do uh, the work uh, to add to the legacy of the historic South Southside, and to Robert's point, that goes well beyond just um, vertical construction. That includes every aspect of contracting um, and every opportunity to provide um, our local community and residents with a little piece of uh, whatever is developed um, here at the local. Uh, historic Sessa. We also have um, great partnerships with our local chambers. Uh, the president of the Fort Worth Metropolitan Black Chamber of Commerce is with us today, Michelle Green Ford, um, as well as our uh, Hispanic um, uh, Chamber of Commerce um, led by Annette Landeros. Both of them um, uh, have agreements with the city to help um, with outreach. Uh, and engagement. We want you to be successful. And so uh, we understand kind of the lay of the land and, and uh, who um, might be a good fit for some of the, the projects that um, are going to be developed uh, throughout this process. And so we want to help you make those connections early, right? We want you to start having conversations and on a regular basis. Um, with the contractors in our community and our uh, local residents. Uh, and our chambers are poised to be able to help you do that as well as well. And we'll make just one other note. Um, again, if, as we kind of work through this process, we get to the point where we're structuring some type of incentive. And I know this question got asked when we were uh, uh, across the street walking around. Uh, when we have incentive agreements that involve mixed use development, residential development, uh, we do have an affordable housing commitment tied to that. Uh, so by policy, it's 10% of those units would be at 80% AMI and another 10% would be at 60% AMI. So at least 20% uh, in total, uh, but split up in those 10 and 10 categories. It's 2026 to be expended, totally expended, but 2024 to be committed. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's where some of the concern comes in. I mean, to, to commit the ARPA dollars, we would have to go through this process, have a certified site plan. You all would have to go through all of these development issues that we've discussed already, and then we would have to be able to take a deal to council. So mm -hmm. we're we're almost in April now, uh, being able to get all of that done by December is probably going to be a tight push. Uh, so again, uh, that's that's we just have to be cognizant of that. Correct. Question regarding um, Back to incentive dollars, but more so incentive dollars for um, those in the community who may want to be to operate businesses in the project, you know, you're, you know, being in retail or things of that nature. Does economic development have programs like that to sort of help the community business opportunity? Yeah, we, we do. I mean, it's, it's, um, again, it's going to be very case by case, you know, depending on what, what specific types of uses come forward. But yeah, I mean, we are. We are committed to being as creative as we can be to to bring those types of uses forward. Yeah. Uh, 
because there are TIF dollars involved. Um, and you know, TIF incentives are part of this as well as 380 incentives that are based upon your property taxes um, and your sales tax. Um, you know, it's gonna be very hard to do a same deal with a tax exempt entity. So as you're putting together your proposal, if you're thinking about proposing a tax exemption uh, for property taxes, um, just understand that that will definitely impact, if not negate, a 380 agreement and a tax agreement. Um, the other thing we wanted to point out is um, uh, one, one issue that came up with the prior proposal was um, the issue of live work units. Um, and that is a proposal, you know, to sort of address a retail concern. We don't consider them on this panel um, live work units to be retail or office at all. Um, and I, we've never really seen it work. <laughs> so if, 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 the, if the solution to providing mixed uses is, is live work, then don't expect a good rating on that. That's not, that's not how we're going to prove it. You know, that's not good enough to provide retail and office needs to this community. So actually, uh, we should agree with Warren and Steele. And my question was around Section 3. So I'm assuming there's a Section 3 business concern um, goal as well as the Section 3 worker goal. Yeah, for any federal funds that are uh, involved, yes. But not not local funds. No, though. not local not funds. Local. Yeah. But that said, <laughs> we would really like to see the neighborhood benefit from employment opportunities and from, uh, you know, everything to do with this development. So um, while Section 3 may not be required, depending on the incentives that are involved, um, we we would like to see some Section 3 thinking on this project. We did uh, negotiate in the prior deal that there were a certain percentage of uh, jobs that would be tied to the residents of the community. So again, that's not a federal requirement. That was just kind of a local negotiation that we did. 30 jobs is what the previous one was. Expand, expand on the boundaries, which I'll say on the previous projects. Go ahead. The boundaries would be with size, based on 35, and on the expand of uh, Expand where, where the... the the contract for your time, it's all working from a you Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, being technical about it, the, the, the boundaries that we work in from a business equity standpoint is really our six county region. So it's, again, there's there's kind of a specific focus that we would like to see folks from the neighborhood, but but at the end of the day, the, the companies that meet that percentage are, are drawn from the six county region. Section six county costs. Okay. Uh, okay. Any any uh, business entity that uh, comes from Holland or some other surrounding body um, that has done a million dollars of business in our marketplace is also eligible. Is there going to be a payment and performance bonding requirement? Um, we have not had one previously on it. So again, I think that would, that would be part of, part of any negotiation we would have. Yeah. So that's how we were negotiating that to make sure that things are moving along. I just have one last question. Yeah. So I'll stop. Is from Parks, maybe Lori or Richard, are they still on the phone by chance? Lori, are you with us still? I don't see her, Martha. Yeah. Okay. What do you need? I was just curious. Um, there's a bunch of really nice trees out there. I didn't know if any of those um, were classified as heritage trees and fell into any form of like tree protection category. They 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 are not. For those around. There was there was a bit of tree demolition as part of that. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Uh, what about geotech? Was there uh any soil samples or anything like that done? Or you could have access? Yeah. 
No, but we can we can pick them up. Yeah, so um we've done extensive phase one, phase two, and um you know uh environmental cleanup. Um in fact the city's paid for all of that. Um, and really what's what's in the soil um, in, on just, I think, three sites um, is lead-based paint from demolition. So it's not deep, it's just in the soil and theoretically could actually be dug up and characterized as construction goes on. Um, but we're going to do the full cleanup and have it certified by the state. I think those that should be wrapped up by, what do we say? Q3, Q4 of this year. Everything should, be, should we'll have a VCP closure on it. Yeah. Yeah. So all but those three parcels have VCP closures already. Yes. yes. Hey, what about the uh, bridge structure? So is there like a reclamation? Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, there's a tree growing out in the middle of it. Um, uh, probably you don't want to keep that um but uh it's been open for a really long time um the a developer would probably need to do an assessment a building assessment and make sure that nothing toxic was in there before we demolished demolished it but there's no expectation of keeping that building although the neighborhood uh, neighborhood might like to keep some bricks or yeah yeah i think they they had done a study on it previously and it was not structurally savable so uh but we did encourage there's some creative way to include can someone online mute themselves i'm sorry we're hearing some laughing come through no laughing <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what previously <laughs> that's kind of what was found any questions online mm -hmm. Well, before we wrap this up, I also wanted to mention, would you like to touch on the finance aspect of it or just briefly? Hold on, Peter, you want me to go into that? Yeah, um, I'll touch on that. So yeah, Martha did mention, um, again, the first, first couple of slides of the presentation, again, kind of those minimum requirements that we're looking at, looking at to really advance to the next stage. Um, again, part of that was having a project of uh, 50 million or more uh, and the other being um, having done so that in WPE work, business equity work. Uh, it, it's really important for us uh, to, especially coming out of our, our past experience on the project, to have a team that we can actually see some physical work on the ground. Uh, in fact, that was part of some of the stuff we were talking about, like whoever we move forward with, we actually want to be able to go visit their projects that they have developed. Uh, and so, you know, the overall financing of this project as far as, far as how we move forward is, is really important. Um, we, we don't want to be in a situation again where we spent another two to three years working with the development team and couldn't get the financing pulled together. So we want to make sure that whoever we move forward with, you all have a comfort level. We have a comfort level with them that this project can be financed and pulled together. And you all have a comfort level with us uh, that we are doing everything that we can to be as uh, creative as we can be when it comes to Utilize the public dollars to help this thing move forward. So again, it's this. This is as Lorraine kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a hand in glove process between the public private sector uh, and the community, and we really want to make sure that we actually get this thing off the ground. And you know, as a part of the process, um, there we go. Um, so as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and we will post it by Thursday. Um, submissions, if you forgot, um, are due Monday, April 22nd um, by 5 p.m. And that can be emailed to rfei at fortworthtexas.gov. That's the same email that you registered for this meeting at. Um, please do save the tape, save the date for those potential finalist interviews. Um, and kind of speaking to Robert's point, you know, at our finalists, um, when we kind of call those folks back in at that time, we will probably be asking for more financial information, you know, financial proof, however you want to show that. Um, so do be prepared. That's not in the original selection criteria, but we're going to really be checking on that. And um, those will be some questions we would probably address and be asking about and wanting to see in those um, the, the finalist interviews. Um, 
other than that, everything else will be posted um, at our fortworthtexas.gov slash Evro website. Um, like I said, tons of background on there, years and lots of history. Um, hopefully everything that you need is, is going to be there. Um, I know one of our developers here did mention, you know, signing up for a PDC that is available to all teams um, by reaching out to Tony on this call. Um, they'd be happy to sell up, set up a pre-development conference for you to ask any more insight um, or site-specific um, questions. So um, if, that, if there's any other questions, I think please email that web. Please email RFEI at fortworthtexas.gov. Got one last one. Yeah. The selection committee. All right. Oops. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I will thank you all for uh, coming out and uh, learning about the project. And we look forward to seeing all of your submittals on April 27th. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tony and development yeah. service team. Yeah, thank you all very much. Yeah.